for you and also explain to you what the comorbidity really means according to Dr. Bidu Sarkodie. He just uh, explained that and said that the youngest person to have lost his life as a result of COVID-19 is nine years old and the oldest is 82 years old. A wide gap, honestly, and um, a lot of questions have arisen. But anyways, uh, you're welcome. It's COVID-19. We're on till 11.30 and my name is Berla Mundi. And my name is Anita Ekir Kuf. With this is COVID-19 360. Globally, we've gone past the 4 million mark and inching closer to the 5 million mark due to the number of tests being conducted on the African continent. And so right here on COVID-19 360, we will be bringing you all the figures from uh, globally to the African continent and right here in Ghana. My name is Anita Ekir Kufu. Stay tuned. Bella? Well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so... Quick correction is 5,172. And so today we'll be speaking to um, our doctors and they'll be giving us some answers as to what exactly may be happening and how we can get out of it. Um, and so uh, it says that out of the 22 deaths that we have recorded, by the way, 90.9% have comorbidity. And according to Dr. Bedu Sakure, that means that they have some underlying ailments and um, the association is what may have led to the death of these people. However, what he did mention was that there hasn't been any autopsy to really verify which of these other ailments or whether it was exactly COVID-19 that led to the death. And he says that 9.1% of the people who have died don't have any underlying ailments, okay? Now, out of the 90.9%, it uh, says that 136 of them had just one other condition, 63.6% had two conditions, and 136 uh, of those people also had three or more conditions. And this was an explanation as to the comorbidity rate um, associated with the 22 people who have died from COVID-19. And so on that note, uh, we'll be taking a look at the global figures. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, globally, we've crossed the 4 million mark now. We are at over 4.2 million globally. Uh, and also the active cases standing at 2.4 million with 1.5 million recoveries so far and then 287,000 deaths. And when it comes to the countries who are making up half of the world's case counts, the United States is leading with 1.3 million. And over the past 24 hours, they've racked up some 80,000 more coronavirus cases with Spain coming in second also with uh, 227,436. Earlier on within the week, Russia was hanging in around the 11th highest uh, globally and they've been able to move all the way, uh, gone past Germany and also France and Italy and now they are the second when it comes to the highest with over 232,243 cases being recorded by Russia. Italy also coming in with 219,814 and these countries make up half of the world's case count with, uh, with the United States of America leading and also when it comes to recoveries the United States of America is leading globally. Germany as well, Spain, China and Brazil also lead with recoveries globally. That is totally 717,856 recoveries. Now let's come to the African continent and on the continent we've done over 1.2 million tests and this morning South Africa has gone past the 10,000 mark. So South Africa is the first country on the African continent with over 10,000 cases. Over 200,000 tests have been done in South Africa and that is definitely giving them that 10,000 and also confirmed cases stands at 67,000 plus on the African continent. And this is about 53 cases per country on the continent. And now coming to the recoveries yesterday, there are recoveries was around 21,000. That is over 21,000. And this morning, uh, we are at 23,000, making up that is about 30% of the cases recorded so far and with our debts moving gradually. Uh, this week started on a rather 2,100 notes, but this morning we're looking at 2,300 plus debts with that accounting to 4% of the total cases recorded on the African continent. And 60% of the continent's cases are active and that is 41%. And about 1,107 of the continent cases are of health workers and 26 of them have been reported dead and so let me move you to the countries on the African continent with the highest recovery South Africa uh, leading with the highest number of cases that is over 
10,000 and still leading with recoveries at 4,357. Algeria, 2,841. Morocco, 2,811. Egypt, 2,172. Cameroon, with 1,465 Nigeria, uh, 902. And with the recoveries in Nigeria, a lot of people are still wondering if they're saying they have been discharged and also the recoveries, if it matches up or they, uh, people who have confirmed positive and later on negative have been discharged to go home because they have recovered or indeed it is just for home management. Djibouti has 872 recoveries, Ivory Coast 818, Guinea 771, Tunisia with 727. And looking at all these figures, Ghana on the West African you know, stage, we have the highest number of cases and our recoveries are quite low. So some people are asking, why is that some of the countries that Ghana even has more cases than our recoveries are still low? Looking at Tunisia, Guinea, Ivory Coast, Djibouti, and even Nigeria, Ghana has more cases than these countries. And so it could be that just as the uh, Ghana Health Service have announced this morning, definitely we're waiting more recoveries to be recorded or more tests are also being waited for. Uh, that is over some 100 uh, cases being awaited. And so we're hoping that with that number, our recoveries will be going up higher and then definitely will also be counted as the high-ranking recoveries on the African continent. Certainly. And uh, we'll also tell you which of the other ailments, underlying ailments, accounts for the number of deaths in the country. But before that, let's quickly take a look at Dr. Patrick Abouage's, um, you know, announcement on air, uh, telling us what Ghana's case count was. And he broke it down um, to even tell us which of the hot spots we should, um, you know, focus on and all that. And so we'll quickly play that and give, give you that opportunity to take a look at the numbers again. And, um, come on, colleagues, Honorable Minister, Today, as was Thank you very much. the usual update of our, our figures and where we are, and then do some extra work on our district um, distribution so that people get to know where the hotspots are and how to uh, be careful of where and what we do. So far, we have recorded this uh, morning, I mean, waking from the data from the 11th of May, 427 new cases, bringing our total to about three. Bringing our total to. Yes, sir. 5,127, uh, we just have mixed up. The total new cases from the 9th was 277, um, 160 for the 10th, and we have two, 427 new cases for uh, yesterday. Out of that, 272 of them has come from Obuasi Township alone. 1,074 1, has come from routine surveillance, and then 1,538 has come from the enhanced surveillance, which we continue to do. Our total recoveries, as I said today, is 494, and we have about 180 awaiting their second negative test, which will give us, which will increase the number of recoveries. That brings our active cases, active cases to 4,611. And as I mentioned the last time, the 4,000 active cases are those that are still in management, either they are in isolation, either in a special isolation center, isolation at home, or they are in our facilities being cared for. 4,006 and six of them are currently responding to treatment, and five are critically ill at our various health centers, mainly in Accra. I will just um, go into the core uh, cases as uh, we have them raging. Greater Accra is recording a total of 3,981, an increase of 89, and I'll get into more details when we get to the district 
levels. Ashanti has moved from 355 to 662 with a new case of um, 307. Central region had an increase of 27, bringing their total to 154. Western region had three new cases, so they are now 52. Eastern had no new case, so they are still at 99. Upper West had no new case. Upper East had no new case. OT had no new case. And that's what the region, that's Western, Northeast. And that was Dr. Patrick Abwaji, the Director General of the Ghana Health Service. And uh, this was just uh, a few minutes ago when he was addressing the press, um, uh, the Ministry of Information Press Briefing, giving us the numbers. Now, he also put out some numbers. And honestly, today, the press briefing had a lot of figures, um, you know, from death rate to recovery, um, you know, to the hot spots where he mentioned in the greater Accra region, we had Tema Metro, uh, well, actually, Accra Metro uh, recording 10 cases, Tema West recording four new cases, uh, Kole Clote also recording 27 new cases, Kwon Katamanso 24 new cases, Adentan Municipality four new cases, and there were a lot of them as well. But we're going to cross over to the Ashanti region. Now, since yesterday, we've been giving you updates on Obwase in particular becoming the epicenter for the Ashanti uh, region. Now, yesterday, a facility was supposed to be converted into a holding center for people with COVID-19. Now, um, people in the area kicked against it to the extent that even yesterday, they locked up the holding center and it took the intervention of the police um, to have it open and transport the COVID-19 patients to uh, the isolation center. So we have on the line the DCE um, for the area and so she'll be speaking to us. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Hello, Hello ma'am. Good morning. Can you hear me please? Yes, I can hear you. All right, good to have you I'm on COVID-19 360. We're live on TV3, and I hope you're doing well. Uh, very well, very well. But all you're right. Great. You're all right, great. Now, can you update us on what's happening with the holding center in Obwase at the moment? Thank you. Uh, the holding center at the moment, uh, it's taking. Hello? There is calm. There is calm. There is no more resistance. No more resistance. But what, what, yeah. what was the reason why the people in the area close to the isolation center were resisting having it uh, situated there? I feel uh, uh, there was lack of understanding. Their explanation was uh, far from the normal. The way they were understanding it was different. Mm. Some said they understand it's airborne disease. And for that matter, the wind can blow... Uh, the virus to certain uh, kilometers and others, mm. which uh, we explained to them that uh, that, is, that is not the case. So uh, later on, uh, we, we, they all agreed, even though some may be, uh, some may be not uh, uh, well satisfied, but they had no option, we also had no option, we have to keep them there. Does it mean that education for the past few weeks in Obwasi East hasn't really gone down well with residents? Reason being why they kicked they, against it? Uh, in fact, for education is ongoing. Mm. It is going on well with them. But just that human nature, human nature, because it is not me, because it is not me and it is you, it, it's an issue. Yeah. But if it's me, it's okay. That's how I say it. Okay. So yesterday, when we told them that the, the COVID cases in their own community, that facility, I mean, cannot contain it. Mm -hmm. So do we need them to stay with them in their various homes? That is where they, uh, that is where they, uh, they, they to calm down. Okay. Because uh, shouting, uh, we will get to resist. You, you, you can't foretell whether you are staying with the patient right in your home. Mm hmm mm hmm Okay. And the number of cases in that particular suburb uh, would be far more than the people that that facility can hold. Mm. 
So they, they, they realize that after all, uh, we are victims. We, we, we can all be uh, positive at any point in time. Okay. And I, I, I was asking them, as you speak, you've not tested your status. How do you know? Yeah. When you're going to get positive. If you should be tested uh, positive today, we mm. told your family. Yeah. So later on, they understood and okay. they allowed us to use the facility. So if I may ask, uh, how many people do we have at this holding center? And um, are these also people, uh, you know, the people who are there, do they also include people with mild cases who may not have the opportunity to self-isolate? Uh, the center is said that everybody is confined in his or her own room. Mm. You don't see the least. You don't communicate to each other. To each other, okay. So even if, even if the levels are not the same, uh, they can't have a uh, transfer of transmission. Mm. Okay. That's what I'm asking. And, and, uh, the number for now, the facility can hold, uh, the facility is 13 capacity. Okay. But for now, uh, 10 was ready for you. Oh, okay. Okay. So that means that, is that the only facility that can house, um, you know, people who have COVID-19? No, we, 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 we have more than that. Okay, okay. We have okay. more than that. We have other areas that we have uh, some patients there mm. who are being limited by the, the health uh, fund lining. Okay. Now, the other issue with other holding centers that we have come across is the fact that for some reason there was no security and so some of these people were able to escape. Um, you know, others were allowed to freely you know, interact with the community according to some reports in some other regions as well. So what's the guarantee that we're protecting these people and also protecting the people in, you know, the, the area as well? Do we have heavy security there? And what's yeah, the process we, like? We, ha we, ha we have security there. Mm. We have uh, security 24-7, uh, day and night. Okay. Security night. Initially, initially some centers, we, we had two policemen running two at night. Okay. But at the moment, uh, we have one at, at the morning and then one at night. All right. Now, away from the isolation center, how are people in Obuasi taking the increase in numbers and the fact that Obuasi now is the epicenter for coronavirus in the Ashanti region? In fact, yeah, it, it, is creating, it, has, it has already created uh, panic and fear. Mm. Because initially, people uh, thought to uh, exaggeration, but... At the moment, it is creating panic and fear. Mm -hmm. But we are still managing it. Okay. All right. And then uh, I'm sure that, uh, like you said, education is still ongoing. And so hopefully it's people ongoing. are it's also ongoing. observing the social ongoing. distancing protocols and all of that. Well, anyway, yeah. thank you so much, Madam Faustina Emisa. She's the DCE for Obwasi East. And we've been speaking to her about the holding center um, in that particular area where people kicked against. Well, as she says, it's housing about 10 of the patients currently, has a 13-bed capacity. And so as and when, they'll update us on what's happening there as well. But anyways, I don't know what you think about this particular issue and the fact that, you know, even as of yesterday, they had locked up the isolation center. So according to Evan Tinkum, they had to transport the patients overnight when everybody else was asleep because that was the best the time, only time yeah. um, to do it. But talking about Obuasi, some other people have also called for a curfew in that particular area. Mm. Uh, looking at the spike in cases and how things are going, there are some fears that it could spread. Looking at the cases that are being recorded, 300 cases and, yeah. and over in that particular area, it's quite worrying. It is. It is, absolutely. And, of course, Kujo Pankuma said that we should not only focus on some of these hot spots, but you never know when it will get to your area as well. And so make sure that you're protecting yourself as much as possible. So just one quick information. So according to Dr. Bedusa Kodier, again, hypertension accounts for the... Um, highest number of deaths uh, in association with COVID, I must say, um, at the moment, with 72.7%. And diabetes mellitus is uh, accounting for 44.5%. Now, we come to chronic heart diseases, and that's 9.1%. Asthma is accounting for 9.1%, and obesity as well. And there are a number of other um, underlying ailments like stroke, acute kidney, 
um, you know, difficulties and congestive heart failure as well. And they are all contributing factors um, to the people who may have lost their lives as a result of COVID-19. And so just in case you have some of these ailments or any other underlying ailments, just be sure to protect yourself as much as possible. Anita. And so we have a breakdown of the situation update of Ghana's case count as at this morning, the 11th of May. And so 161,000 tests have been conducted so far with 5,127 uh, confirmed as positive cases. That is an additional 427 new cases from our previous tally of 4,700. And so for confirmed cases from routine surveillance, we have 1,474. Initially, it was a little over 900. And so there's been an increase for the routine surveillance, which we've been told are people who walk into uh, various health facilities and show symptoms and after being tested uh, it's been confirmed that they have the coronavirus so for confirmed cases among travelers under quarantine and that particular category has been uh, there's been a lot of questions about it as well we're not seeing any recoveries from that uh, parameter as well and so what is happening with the people who were mandatorily quarantined uh, when they came into the country so that still stands at 115 and for confirmed cases from enhanced surveillance that is the contact tracing that is being done we have 3,538 total number of deaths among confirmed cases stands at 22 initially it was at 18 so four more have been recorded giving us 22 and so the total number of recoveries stands at 490 and for the recoveries, we're still waiting for some more uh, recoveries to be recorded. Over 180 are in waiting, and we're waiting for that as well. And for the fish factory that uh, we had some over 533 out of 1,300 people being confirmed as positive as well. Some have been retested, some uh, 50 of them, and so they've tested their first negative. And so we're hoping that after the next test, they will have another negative, giving us two double negatives, and we can confirm them as recovery. And so 4,606 cases are well and responding to treatment, five critically ill and are at the various uh, treatment centers. Now, let's give you the regional distribution uh, as at this morning, the Greater Accra region leading as the epicenter. And uh, the interesting thing about the Greater Accra region is the fact that when you look at the cases recorded in just the Greater Accra region, it is even more than some of the cases recorded in some of the African countries like Tunisia and Cote d'Ivoire. And that is over 3,892 as at May 9th and then 11th May 3,981 with a difference of 89. The Ashanti region uh, having high numbers due to the spike in coronavirus cases in Obuasi from 355 to 662. That is an additional of 307. Central region also steadily moving up. As at May 9th, the central region had um, 127 cases. May 11th, 154. An additional of 27 new cases. The western region was at 49 as at May 9th and then May 11th Western region with an addition of three cases given it 52 and so the other regions Eastern, Upper West, Upper East, Volta, OT, Western, North and Northeast, Northing uh, haven't recorded any new cases but their case count as at May 11th stands at the Eastern region is at 99, Upper West 21, Upper East 26, Volta 33, OT 24 western north 56 uh, northeast to northing 16 and then uh, for Buno we have just one mm. and so basically these are the uh, breakdowns and also they gave us uh, the outbreak concentration that is when you go on the um, Ghana Health Service uh, website you definitely find these details of the hotspots and all of mm -hmm. that and also 89 new cases uh, 40 from routine surveillance 49 from the enhanced contact tracing that is for the 427 new numbers we have and so for the current hotspots we have Tema Metro Kuali Klote and Accra Metro so all of these details has been given in uh, point by point and also for those of of you who have been asking more about the hotspot because you want to know the various areas that were recording more cases all of these uh, data has been given and so if in the voter region the central region you can find all of that but let me give you a breakdown of the voter region uh, with regard to the hot spots for the voter region 33 confirmed cases one new case today and the affected districts are k2 south 
21 new cases, Kwando with one, Hohoi with seven, Ho with four, and the central region has 27 new confirmed cases, largely from the enhanced uh, surveillance and also the affected district, uh, Cape Coast, Ejumaku, and Ewim. And also some 148 fishermen are under quarantine and they are still being treated and hopefully they will recover. Bella. All right. Well, yes. And so also in the Shanti region, there were also some hot spots. Now, the central market has been closed and that's because they um, recorded some new cases. And this they're saying is from a couple um, from that market. And that's as a result of the central market being closed. There's Wawa say there's a song Corey um, and there's in Carrier or Forikrom. I know Forikrom recorded 25 cases in Carrier with five cases and so on and so forth. And again, a reminder, so the youngest person to have lost his or her life from COVID is nine years and the oldest is 82 years. We'll be speaking to our health experts and also today we'll be speaking to Becca. Uh, she has recorded a special COVID-19 song uh, for our health workers. And so we'll touch on that and a lot more on COVID-19 360. We'll be right back. Welcome back to COVID-19 360. Now time to speak to our doctors. Today we have Dr. Neiman Arthur joining us on the line. He's our clinical psychologist and he's been helping us deal with the issues surrounding COVID-19 psychologically. And so it's good to have you. Dr. Bertha will be joining us shortly. Dr. Neiman, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you doing too? I'm good, thank you very much. I can't say the same for people who may have underlying ailments at this point, especially after the details that were given during the press briefing this morning. Now, according to Dr. Pedusa Kodie, hypertension is accounting for the highest uh, number of COVID-19 related deaths. So what he said is that he, we're not saying that hypertension is a cause of death amongst these people necessarily once they get um, COVID-19, but rather they are working hand in hand, if you get what I mean. And so he gave a breakdown of some of these other underlying ailments that may... Um, usually Doc, can you hear me? Dr. Newman, can you hear me? You can hear me now. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, and I can see you. Awesome. Yes. So I was just saying yes. that the yes. issue about people who have lost their lives as a result of COVID-19, now we've been given some figures as to how many of them may have comorbidity which in relation is the underlying um, ailments. Now, hypertension is said to be one of the ailments with the highest number of deaths. We have diabetes, mellitus, chronic heart conditions, asthma, stroke, and a number of them. I mean, as much as it's important that we have this conversation, what could happen to people who already have some of these underlying ailments? Could it not worsen their situation and even make them yeah. more scared? So, uh, death by COVID-19 relating to these kind of illnesses mm -hmm. has to do with the fact that, you know, when you have COVID-19, it worsens underlying medical condition okay. because of the impact on the body itself. So, for example, if someone has hypertension and is likely probably to die in the next year or two, mm -hmm. COVID-19 will make them that clear because it, it adds on to the problem. So, it may not be COVID-19 uh, exclusively, but the fact that the impact of COVID-19, in addition to the impact of that underlying medical condition, when you combine the two, mm. then it's easier from the two, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so that is, it, it's not like when you get COVID-19 and you have underlying illness, um, it is the COVID-19 that will kill you. Okay. Dr. Newman, are you there? A bit of a challenge again. I guess we're not out of the woods when it comes to our network um issues but he was just explaining to us um the relation between COVID-19 and other underlying ailments and so here it says that out of the 22 deaths about 90.9 percent of them have comorbidity and those are the underlying ailments that I mentioned earlier now it says that 9.1 percent of the people who have died don't have comorbidity and so it's obvious that they died solely from COVID-19. Now 13.6 of the people with comorbidity had just one condition, 63.6% had two conditions and another 13.6% had three or more of such conditions. Now looking at the various regions, Greater Accra region accounts for the highest number of deaths with 68.2%. Now Ashanti region um, has 18.2% and Upper East has 9.1%. North East has 4.5%. Dr. Newman, you're back. 
All right. So carry on, please. I, yes. So I, I, I've forgotten. I, I don't know where I left off. I think the network is, is very bad here. Yes. Right. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that people, the combination of COVID-19 and other health problems, the combination makes their situation worse. And that's it. So yes. some may die because of complications of the hypertension that is worsened by COVID-19. But now, you know, what is happening is that anybody who dies from a certain illness who has COVID-19, now we blame it on COVID-19 because mm. of the impact of COVID-19. So if, you know, there are a lot of reports all over the world about this person died from COVID-19 and all that. But it is possible that it may not be directly the COVID-19, mm -hmm. but the fact that they have a certain condition. So they may have died anyway, maybe some time later, but COVID-19 makes it worse. Yeah. All right. So when we say COVID-19, I think that we should be able to explain it well. That if the person has hypertension or diabetes, they may have it, you know, it may be bad, you know, before even COVID-19 even, even entered. Mm. But the presence of COVID-19 is worse. So that may not be exclusively by COVID-19. And that is what I think the, the mistake is. That okay. people are relating every COVID-19 because they have COVID-19. Okay. Know, and, and that is what, if you look, Italy, U.S. and all that, there are people who are taking advantage of COVID-19 to pronounce deaths by COVID-19 just any, anyhow they want, mm. right? So if someone has some heart problems and even the cause of death is more by the heart problem than COVID-19, they will blame it on COVID-19. On COVID-19, right? okay. Okay. But COVID-19 worsens underlying health conditions. Okay. And some underlying health conditions like diabetes will make your immune system very weak so that COVID-19 has a greater impact on your life. Oh, I and, see. And that, that, that is basically, yes. Okay. Dr. Bertha just joined us as well, and so we'd like to say hello and good morning to her. Dr. Bertha, can you hear us? Um, good morning. I'll be available by video shortly, so I'll just go join by audio at this time. No problem. But I know you've also been listening into the conversation with Dr. Newman Arthur. Uh, concerning the underlying ailments, and I, I'm sure you'd want to touch on that before we move on. Um, yeah, I haven't been listening, so okay. if you can pose the question, I'll be happy to join well, in. Well, what we asked him, and he did explain that uh, for people with underlying ailments, I mean, once you have it and COVID-19 comes in the way as well, because your immune system is weakened, um, it makes it easier for you to succumb. Dr. Newman, that's what you said, right? So. Exactly. It makes it easier for you to succumb. What I wanted you to do was to just further break it down for us because a few ailments have been mentioned like hypertension, diabetes mellitus, chronic heart disease and asthma. So for something like hypertension, um, how does it then affect you further if you already have hypertension and COVID-19 comes along? Okay, so let me try and explain it. I don't know what has been discussed already. So yeah. Comorbid condition is not a new expression to COVID-19. When you go to medical school, one of the first things you should learn, if somebody comes with a complaint of, say, they have stomach problems, you're supposed to ask them what their other medical problems are. So co means it's together with something else. So somebody can come in with a headache mm -hmm. and you say there are comorbid conditions, are hypertension, that and that. And so what was noticed earlier on in the outbreak was that there were specifically three conditions, hypertension, Mm -hmm. diabetes and lung difficulties that were seen to be increasing the mortality of those who were dying. And I'll just break it down. So why hypertension is an issue is that when somebody has hypertension, it means that the pressure against which their heart has to pump blood around mm -hmm. on a daily basis is, is high. Mm -hmm. So over time, the heart gets enlarged. We call it the hypertensive heart disease. If someone dies and you, you open their heart muscle, you realize that the muscle is thicker. It's been trying to work hard against the blood pressure. And invariably, the hypertensive heart disease can also lead to coronary artery disease or closure of the vessels around their heart. So you have somebody whose heart has been overworking and they're trying to deal with a problem in which there's difficulty or access to oxygen. So now... The heart that was already overworked is now tasked with another problem, trying to meet a condition of high oxygen or better to low oxygen availability. So that is why it leads to a higher death rate. And the reason why diabetes also leads to a higher death rate is through a different mechanism. Okay. This time, it's through the decrease in the movement of the white cells. So 
part of our immune system. In fact, the major component of our immune system has to do with um, the white blood cells, specialized cells in the blood, which move to areas where there's an infection. Okay. Are, are you able to hear me? Yeah, in yeah. areas where there's an infection. And it has long been known that in diabetics, the movement of the white cells, which in medical literature we call it diapedesis, is very, very slow. And there's a test called the nitrosolium blue test to measure diapedesis. So if I were to put your white cells against somebody who has diabetes, mm -hmm. um, assuming there's a goalpost and we are all running to get a, a, a soccer ball into the goalpost, the, the patient who, has, who doesn't have diabetes, their, their white cells will be running as fast as maybe Usain Bolt. And then the one who has diabetes will literally be walking towards the soccer ball to go and shoot it. Mm. So literally, the difference is that the white cells are slow. So there's even no way to change that. It's because of the long-standing high glucose levels and the way it has affected the, the white cells' ability to fight infection. And when it comes to patients with breathing problems like asthma and what we call um, COPD. Mm. COPD patients have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. They've been smoking for a long time. Some of them too is not smoking. Their mechanism is also different. Okay. Because the lung is already compromised in its ability to breathe, when you have diabetes, um, COVID-19 added on top of it, it also decreases their ability to fight the, the disease. So you mm. have three different diseases operating at different levels to decrease a person's ability to fight this. So those without comorbid conditions, a young 21-year-old gentleman, like the Cameroonian that they wrote about in the literature who recovered, yeah. he doesn't have heart disease, his heart is so young, his white cells are so active, and he does, he, maybe they've not been smoking, or even if they've been smoking, it's not long enough to give rise to... Um, COPD. So that is why they always talk about the comorbid conditions. So, so if I have any of these conditions that you have talked about, um, in terms of boosting my immune system, is it different from how a regular person with no underlying ailments would boost their immune system? Because I know that with some of these ailments, there are certain things you can eat, there are certain things you should avoid, and all of that. Um, so if somebody has diabetes, for example, the way to boost their immune system, because the, the higher your glucose, so when people come into the hospital with diabetes, we measure something called the hemoglobin A1C. It tells us how well they've been managing their glucose over a three-month period. And invariably, those with high hemoglobin A1Cs, you realize that they, they are the ones who come in with severe infection because for a long time, their blood glucose level has been... It's been so high that it's been reducing the white cell's ability to walk or using the soccer field example that I gave you. So their way of boosting their immune system is actually to control their glucose, make sure they're taking their insulin. So around this time, the advice I would give to anybody who has diabetes is please make sure you are adhering to your medic. And that is why the president and most leaders around the country, even in the lockdown, yeah. they gave leeway that if you are on medications, you are allowed to still leave your house and go and get whatever medicine you need to take care of your illness. And the patients with diabetes too, I mean with hypertension, Ghana, Africans in general, this has been studied by Professor Adi long ago, that mm. for some reason, it's not just the Africans in the, in the U.S., Africa, any person of black color, for some reason we have a very high risk of hypertension. And unfortunately, a lot of it is untreated. So if you ask somebody like Professor Dr. Atalu of the stroke unit, they will tell you people come in with way too many strokes mm. because of untreated hypertension. Yeah. So the hypertensive will have to boost their ability to fight this disease by controlling their hypertension. And those who smoke, obviously, not just COVID-19, but smokers have been known to have high rates of um, COPD and pneumonia, from long ago so everybody's mechanism is different okay. then okay. to the lay person who doesn't have diabetes the way of boosting their immune system is to just eat well which is what the president was kind enough to share with us i i saw he was mentioning cashews and da all the good things cocoa, yes. Was, yes he did a good job so we we actually need to be eating those things because some people think oh take this medicine take vitamin this it will boost your immune system but the immune system really 
It's not different from the rest. If, you're, if you are healthy, your skin is healthy, remember that your skin, everything about you is still feeding off of the same nutrition. That is why, if you remember, if you read about Koshioko days, when those young kids cannot get enough protein, their hair gets thin, their face starts getting discolored, they got these big tummies because the overall body nutrition is reduced. And similarly, their immune system is reduced. So the immune system is not a box hiding somewhere. It yeah. is your own body cells that need to be built up to fight the, the, the disease, any disease that comes its way. All right. Dr. Newman, would you, would you still want to touch on this? Yes. Okay. Because I noticed you were nodding. You know, I always go to the, to the psychology side yeah. <laughs> so that we can, have, we can have some balance. And so in addition to what Dr. Beta said, Reducing your stresses and also anxieties would help control all these diseases well and also improve your immune system. It will stress depresses the immune system, worsens underlying health conditions by all the stress hormones that are released when someone is stressed or anxious, mm. you know, increases blood pressure, you know, affects sugar control, worsens underlying heart problems and all that. So if people are able to manage their stresses and also they don't panic, they are able to deal with all these underlying medical conditions very well. There are some people who come to the hospital, and if they don't manage their stresses, controlling the blood pressure becomes very, very difficult yeah. because the body is always at heightened state, you know, heightened state. So all these stresses around this time and also uh, other people, uh, people who are not worsening and all that around this season can worsen the underlying health condition. So managing their stress and anxieties can also help. Yeah, but how do I manage it? I mean, should I avoid reading the stories online? Should I avoid listening to the news? Because I need to know in order to protect myself as well. But maybe the more I know, well, the more stressed out yes, I become. I, yes, I, I think, I think we, we've talked about managing stress and anxiety yeah. on this show. Almost every we talk about it. But what I want to say about information in terms of these anxieties, people should, you know, when you hear something, make sure you are hearing the whole truth and not part of the truth. Because the truth is that if you have an underlying condition, it is not a death sentence that if you get COVID-19, you are going to die. There are a lot of people who have underlying medical condition, but they are surviving. Actually, majority of the people who have underlying health condition, if they get COVID-19, they are going to survive. Mm -hmm. That rate is high or still like 5 to, to, to about 15%, depending on the health condition. But it is not 100% that when you get COVID-19, you have an online health condition, you are going to die. So the information has to be balanced. Anybody Now, I tell people that if you hear something on TV or, or radio or from the internet, make sure that you read the full story. You know, make sure you read other news in relation to that kind of information. Because if you are, you know, there are some people who are afraid to even do anything now because they have health and online health condition. They are mm. panicking all the time. You know, I know someone who came, you know, panicking, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. You know, and I had to, I had to calm her down, you know, and explain things. And so a balanced information is what is going to help. If you have underlying health condition, your risk of dying is higher than the general population, someone who doesn't. But it doesn't mean that when you get COVID-19, you are going to die. You know, it's like automatic that everybody who has this and that is going to die because majority of them are going to survive. Mm -hmm. It is not a death sentence. So this kind of information is what people should think about. Yes, I have an aligned condition. I must be cautious. You know, I must do all the preventive thing. I must stay home. I must do that, that, that. But it shouldn't, it shouldn't cause you to panic such that you, you virtually, your, your life is, is just coming to an end. And now you are thinking, I will die, I will die, I will die. Because that kind of panicking is what is also going to make your underlying health condition worse. And you may die from that and uh, not COVID-19. And also, I want to add that, you know, people with underlying health condition who are supposed to be coming for reviews in the hospital, majority of them are not because they are afraid to catch the disease, right? And yeah. some of them, because of that, have off their medications for a long time. Sometimes people come to see me in a consulting room and for, for like two or three months, they've not come around and they are not taking their, their medications. And for those who also don't understand what their disease is, like some people have hypertension, they don't even understand what it is. And so they feel that, okay, COVID-19, I can be off my drug and I'll be fine. 
and the stresses of you know maybe taking insulin injections mm -hmm. or taking medication people think that this is because they are not coming to the hospital it's free for them you see it's like they are happy even for covid-19 because they will not be forced to come to the hospital for medication yeah. because they already want those medications so they are using covid-19 as an excuse not to even take their medications they are likely to die from complications of hypertension itself than covid-19 so around this time, people should have their balanced information. They should keep taking their medications. They should, they should not panic. They should continue with whatever management they are. And if getting to the hospital is difficult, they should online, you know, calling the higher facility, seeking directions and all that about your illness would help. Otherwise, you may die from that illness and not necessarily COVID-19. Okay. All right. Now, also, one of the other things that can boost your immune system, and this was a discussion we had this morning, even with um, the managing director of the cocoa processing company, is the fact that you need to consume some more cocoa and chocolates as well. And so I wanted you to break it down for us, since you are our health uh, professionals, what exactly the benefits are um, for this. Should we be consuming the chocolates or should we rather look for maybe the cocoa powder, how do we go about this? I don't know which of you will take it, but I'm, I'm trying yeah, to. Yeah, I, I can talk about it okay. a little bit. And Bella, I always like to give super accurate information. So I'm going to give you what I know offhand. Okay. And then I promise to look up all the benefits of cocoa and share it with you. Mm. What I know immediately is that cocoa has antioxidants and some vitamin E. And so antioxidants are very helpful in preventing cancer. Mm. And that is one major benefit we have. And in generally, it keeps you healthy. Yeah. I cannot, um, at this point, without all the necessary research, tell you confidently that cocoa is going to boost your immune system. But antioxidants are useful because they help your cells to regenerate. Mm. They help you looking young. They make sure that you are not aging very quickly. Okay. So that is what I can tell you about cocoa. And what I've noticed is that it's very important to keep life in balance. Drink some cocoa, eat a little bit of this. Don't just focus on one. Mm. Because they've done studies in some Japanese villages and they found out that people who eat a lot of leafy vegetables, that's why some of us, our grandparents lived for, they lived into their 90s. You need to eat a lot of plant-based diets. And cocoa is a plant-based food. So everything God made is good for all of us if we can just focus on eating that less of meat, 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 less of processed foods, and more of a healthy, um, balanced food. Mm. Okay. All right. Dr. Newman. Yes. So again, uh, yeah. Uh, let me add still to the cocoa. Uh, I think that most of the cocoa we have on the, on the shelves, right? Some of them have sweetness and it is not the natural one. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, if, because we are talking about underlying health condition, if you have diabetes or, or things like that, you also have to be careful what you consume on the shelves because some of them are not, you know, the proper cocoa. You know, some of these uh, imported products may not be as healthy as they may they may be put. Some of them are very high sugars. Yeah, but they're so saying we they should consume the locally them. made ones from the cocoa processing well, company. Is that, but if you have an underlying health condition like diabetes, you may have to speak to uh, uh, your dietitian about, about even the quantities and all that. Okay, just to be sure yes. that you're consuming yes, the right... Just, but you know, when, when, when you just say someone should eat cocoa, you know, in our part of the world, how much? Mm. Okay. Dr. Newman, can you hear us? Seems to have frozen again. And so that, that's just um, some quick information for you, especially if you have uh, some underlying conditions. Make sure that you're consulting with your doctors before you consume some of these things. Don't get too carried away. But whichever way, there's hope. And um, hopefully you would survive or hopefully you won't even catch the virus in the first place to even deal with the other symptoms that come with it. Dr. Bertha, well, today I'll just open it up for you. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Newman is back. So let's him just complete um, what he was saying. So I was saying that if you have some online health condition, it's better you seek advice from your dietitian or nutritionist about even the quantity that you can consume in a day. Because some of the products on the shelves uh, may have very, very high sugars. 
Mm. Okay. Dr. Bertha, I I'm not sure if we've touched on this before, but I also saw an update on the semen um, possibly also carrying COVID-19. Um, is that really true? Yes, yes. And, and I think I I've said it a couple of times on your program. Mm. That, um, and that was way before this news became available. I would always give Ebola as an example. And the reason is that coronaviruses, Ebola viruses, HIV, they're all what we call enveloped viruses. It means that when they multiply within the cell and they're leaving, they don't leave um, empty-handed. They take part of your our own cell membranes to literally close those. It's like a guest who comes to your house, chooses to undress, and picks up your clothes and puts it on before they leave. And so they need to be clothed somehow, but they want your clothes instead. So when they're leaving the cell, they take the cell membrane with them. And so they always need to be somewhere in our bodies. And that is why you find HIV virus in the semen. That's why it's primarily a sexually transmitted disease. Mm. That is why Ebola, even a year after people had recovered, you were finding it in, I'm trying to join by video here. Okay. Um, you will find it in um in, 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 in people's semen oh, even a are. year after they had recovered. And mm. also, it is why I was not surprised at all when last week they said some Chinese um, researchers had found the virus for mm. the COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 virus in the semen of a few even asymptomatic patients. But the only caution I'll give here is that finding it is not synonymous with the fact that now the disease can be sexually transmitted because the virus primarily targets the lung cells, mm. which have the angiotensin convert time enzyme 2 um, receptors to infect our bodies. Okay. There are other cells in our bodies who have this receptor, but for some reason, it prefers, it's like a vista who comes into your house and doesn't want to go through the back door or the window. They want to go through your front door, so to speak. So the front door it's actually the lung cells. And so I don't think that sexually transmitted routes is going to be a main means of transmitting this infection to people. So people should not, and I'm bringing that because suddenly some spouses, you'll be surprised the yeah. things people do. Mm -hmm. Some people will suddenly decide that, well, then I'm not having any um, consensual relationships with my husband or wife because yeah. they are recovering from COVID-19. Or some people will even give an excuse and say, oh, I suspect you have COVID-19, yeah. so for now, let's suspend any um, interactions in that, in that area. Mm. So I just want to give a cautionary note about that. Okay, so, but does it then mean that if my partner has it and we have, um, we, we get together, I may also start showing symptoms? No, not at all. So okay. I suppose that's the point I'm saying yeah. that okay. I don't think um, it's, it's a sexually transmitted illness at this point. Okay. So people should feel free to continue in that regard. Of course, you are more likely, if somebody actually has it, you are more likely to get it from that close interaction, exchanging air in that setting than, than, than the fact that it's going to be transmitted in the seminal, in the semen that is released. Okay, Dr. Newman, you are smiling <laughs> about this particular topic. Tell me why. <laughs> That is, that is what I wanted. I wanted to add the last bit, Dr. Beta added. That's okay. what I wanted to add. Okay. And you don't get it from actual sex, but everything around that sexual activity, you may, you are predisposing yourself to COVID-19, to all the touching and kissing and all those things. Mm. It, it's like you are likely to get it uh, because that's it. Because well, people are, when people are intimate. Yeah. <laughs> but how do I not so allow... Tonight, the issue of COVID-19 affects my marriage or, uh, you know, my relationship with my spouse. And I'm asking in relation to people who may have tested positive at a point and have recovered now. Now they come back home and you're not sure if it's even safe to get that close and all of that. So that's what I'm asking you that. No, I will. Well, I mean, I I will. Go ahead. No, please, please, please. <laughs> okay, that's no, a I can, I can, I, I, will, I will let Dr. Newman look at it psychologically. Yeah. But I'm going to just give you a few examples. Um, COVID-19, and I want people to understand this. Just the same way we're talking about crowding and social distancing, 
The home provides a situation where there is no social distancing. And so COVID-19 is primarily a family-related illness. Just get that clear. When someone has it and you test their spouse, you test their children, they most likely have it. Maybe you are not using the right means. If you add the antibody test, you would realize that almost every in the everybody in the household has already been exposed. And I'll give you examples. Tom Hanks got it in Australia. His mm. wife was positive. Um, um, this this um, this actor, uh, what's Idris? his name again? Is it Idris, Idris Alba? Alba had it. His wife automatically, you know, when he was announcing it, his wife was hovering in the background. She had it. Mm. You take this media person, um, Chris Cuomo had it. His wife, and even though they lived, he, he tried to live in the basement of his house and his wife was upstairs. She got it. One child got it. So, and I can give you thousands of examples. Yeah. It is a family-related illness. So just assume your spouse has it. But rather, you should provide support because we've talked about social distancing. It's even worse when people shun you. Already the people outside are stigmatizing you. So if your family stigmatizes you, it's worse. I, I know people who had it and their families assume, you know what? We got it. Let's all get treated. After all, there's no cure. Mm. Rather, let's offer you support. Of course, if you know somebody in your family who has HIV or any of these risk factors we've talked about, then it's important to make sure that you are not unnecessarily exposing them. But we have to still take precautions. Maybe somebody really doesn't have it. The point is to make sure you are showing love and support to this individual who is affected. Mm. Bring them food. Don't go and be sniffing around them and kissing them for sure. But it's important that the family or the marriage becomes an area of supportive network than something that disintegrates because somebody has COVID-19. Okay. So I'll allow Dr. Newman to add his piece. Okay, Dr. Newman. Uh, well, just, just to add to what, what, what she said, I think that it's information, right? Mm -hmm. When the person has it, the person, if the person doesn't have it, the person doesn't have it. So we have to relate with people, whether they have it or not. We have to relate with them with that kind of information. So anybody who has come out of the hospital tested negative and the person doesn't have COVID-19, the person doesn't have it. So people should relate with them on that level. All right. But we should keep all the precautionary measures you know, in place. Mm. And you'll be surprised that someone from the hospital who is negative may come to me, someone who is in the house, who is positive but does not know. Exactly, <laughs> so, that's the thing. So what, that's right. Someone from the hospital, you may rather have it and you don't know. Yeah, that's the problem. So, anyway, I mean, a very funny um, scenario. So maybe your partner has to self-isolate. There's an extra room. But then also, because you're married, this partner, even though they may not be showing any symptoms and all, is asking for you to also... Uh, live up to your responsibilities. What do I do? Do I save my marriage? Do I save my? Do I protect my health? Dr. Newman, come in for us. I think that you know. I think we are making a very big issue out of out of this. Uh -huh. right? Why should COVID nineteen save your marriage? You no, know, but, why should COVID nineteen? But, but in this case, if my husband is supposed yeah. to self isolate, but of course at that point as well, um, you know, he's asking for me to also uh, do what I have to do as a wife. That's what I'm asking. So what do oh. I do? I think it will be irresponsible for the husband to predispose the, the wife to, to, to that kind of, kind, that kind of uh, risk. I, I don't think that is love at all. Okay. So, uh, so when you have it, self-isolating, self-isolate. A family member should do their best to be able to make you comfortable in the house, but prevent them from getting that. Mm. Right? But I don't think of it. issue should dissolve your marriage. You know, COVID-19 is going to pass. It yes, is going it will. to pass. Marriage... It, it, you, anyway. right so we should all be responsible and protect each other for example if a husband and you don't protect your spouses from COVID-19 you may not die but they may die what about the cost of death for them right so we have to be very very responsible in this regard and I think that would help all right yes. thank you so much uh, Dr. Neiman and Dr. Betha uh, it's been a pleasure uh, speaking to you this morning and we hope to speak to you tomorrow as well we're very grateful Thank you very much. All right. Anyway, so like we mentioned, Becca will also be joining us as we celebrate nurses as well as frontline health workers with her new song as well. So keep watching. It's COVID-19 360.
And that's Becca in the background with Overcome. And this is a song that she released about two weeks ago in celebration of frontline health workers. In fact, frontline workers um, in general in the fight against COVID-19. And she joins us uh, via Skype today on COVID-19 360. Good morning. Good morning, Bella. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. How are you I'm doing? I'm fine. I'm fantastic. Thank you so much. Overcome. Tell me the inspiration. I know it's in celebration of, um, you know, frontline health workers. But at the same time, at what point did you decide, I want to do this? Well, I, at that point where I felt like, you know what, I'm an artist. And I could go around the corner and give, you know, 2,000 pieces of hot meal and give boxes of sanitizers and share some PPEs. Um, what about the people around the world? What about people I can't reach? Mm. Um, that just like sparked a bulb in my head. And I said, you know what? One thing I know I can give to the world, not just Ghana, is my voice. Mm -hmm. And so it may have come at a time where, I mean, even in Ghana, the lockdown was over. But I thought, you know what? Let me give that little piece of my voice. Let me send a message across to people that, I mean, I know that, you know, via the internet, you know, mm -hmm. people go on YouTube and stream it. At, le at least I know that people will have an opportunity to be, to have hope, you know, mm -hmm. and through the music that I'm doing. So that's the point where I said, you know what, let me give out through my voice. Okay. And that's when you released this one. Did you write it yourself? And what's been the feedback? Yes, I did write it myself. I actually wrote it with my husband. Okay. The feedback has been enormous. It's been really, really good. Um, so far, so good. I think that it was about time. A lot of people all around the world are doing songs to inspire people. Alicia Keys had one going. And when we looked at Ghana, I just thought, you know what? Why not? I mean, I'm home. A lot of people, kudos to our celebrities who have done so well. They've been going out to support, to give things out. And I just thought, you know what? Why not, you know, just, you know, do something as well for the people. So that's the point why I said, you know what? Let me just go ahead and, okay. and do this song. Now, yes. th there have been calls for people in the music industry to rally together and, you know, yes. educate people with a song or any other means possible. I mean, if you had the opportunity to put out a song, did you consider uh, calling on some of your um, you know, colleagues in the industry to also jump on board? Maybe don't you think that if you had come together, it would have gone farther? Well, I think that I, I wouldn't mind at all. Doing this thing doesn't mean it's the end of it all. I would not mind at all jumping on a song with every single artist in Ghana because it is for a good cause. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, I'm, I'm one to, you know, I'm the sort of person who would love, absolutely love to jump on a song, you know. So, I mean, why not? Why not? Definitely. Okay. But then what's the end game for this song in particular? Are you raising some funds in order to support the fight against COVID-19? What really is the plan? That's, that's the whole idea of doing this song, actually. I mean, usually as an artist, when I do a song, it's an opportunity for me to make some money and put it in the bank, the mm -hmm. bank so that I can, I can spend. But this time, every single proceed coming off the song, whether it's YouTube or iTunes or every streaming and downloading platforms, this money are going to be put together and sent to the trust fund, which has been set aside by the government to, to help fight COVID-19. So that is the end game. Every proceed from this song is oh. going to the trust Set and this is from every stream. So anybody who every downloads stream. or streams it, yeah. have yes, you have you, you monitored? I mean, have you gotten people who are streaming? Um, you know, are you monitoring how much you're making? Is it enough? We're not we're not doing bad at all. I think we still need to, and that's why you know I I. That's why I go back to, I sent you a message and said, you know what, Bella, let's all try and make this happen. Because the thing is that the more we all played on TV, the more people are aware and the more money we raise. Okay, mm -hmm. So far, we're doing good. All telecommunication networks in Ghana, every single one of them are in support of this course. And there's a short code that I put on my Instagram and people can go there and download. It's doing well, but I feel and I believe that we can do much better because this really is for is to fight this to fight this pandemic. Okay, definitely. But aside overcome, uh, which is great by the way, what else have you been working on? Oh boy, yeah. I mean, I mean, of course I'm an artist, so I'm always in the studio. I'm actually working on my fourth studio album. Oh, I see. Um, yes, it's actually it's going to be, I'm sure it's, um, it's ready, but as an artist, I can't sit in my bedroom. I have to go to yeah. the studio, so to get things here and there. So I am working on the album. But yes. I, I thought I heard that you said you were no more a recording artist. And so this is a bit confusing. You've recorded an album, but you're not a recording artist? Did you say that? For the umpteenth time, yeah. So let me repeat 
for the umpteenth time, I'm going to repeat, uh -huh. that I, Rebecca Champon, will remain an artist until the 31st of December, a recording artist. Okay. Until the 31st of December, 2020. I see. Which means up until the 31st of December this year, I will remain a recording artist. Oh, okay. Yeah, and after that, you know, I may once in a while go into the studio, but I'm not going to actively be recording at all. Oh, I, I mean, see. Imagine, imagine, I'm, I'm going to be a performing artist. I'm going to come to your wedding, girl. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be oh, yes, 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 yes. you I have to. You. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to be performing, yes, I do for you. We're going to be, you know, I'm going to be touring, everything. But to go into the studio, I'm going to have concerts. But to go into the studio, actively recording, that I've done for 14 years. There's so much that I want to do now, you know. Yeah. I, I'm still going to be a performing artist, but not a recording artist. Well, is it because you're getting tired of recording? Is that really it? <laughs> I wake up every day. I love recording. It's my love. I love to be in the studio. But I think that at every point in anyone's life, there gets a point where you feel like there's certain things you also want to do. Mm -hmm. Now, I wake up in the morning, I'm in the studio, I'm traveling here to record, and I'm doing that, and I'm doing that. You know, I, I mean, I'm going to the spa to, you know, to make sure everything is fine, making sure my clients are good. I'm going to my real estate. I'm thinking about my logistics business. You know, I have a, I'm a husband. I'm sorry, I'm a wife. And I have a young baby that I'm raising. I'm a yeah. mom. And so, which one of them have I done the longest time? Which mm -hmm. one of them can really just take a little back seat so I that see. I can focus on the rest? That will okay. be my music. So when is recorded. this? When is this album coming out? Uh, it's gonna be. Uh, it was supposed to be out in April, but you know, because of this pandemic, things have been moved back. So I'm looking at sometime around my birthday, which will be in August. In August. What's it called? Do we have a name for it, I believe. We don't have a name for it, but I can give you a clue as to exactly what's on the album. Okay. It's an all it's an all female album. Oh great. Let me correct it. I saw some I saw a lot of people who put it online saying Becca is releasing a feminist album. Uh -huh. I am feminist. That means I believe in the social economic equality of a female. However, I'm not I'm not releasing a feminist album. People shouldn't tag us if I'm about to attack men. I'm releasing an all female album, which means I'm only featuring female artists on this album. Just to correct that. Okay, my producer says we should call the album Obaya album because it's, oh, it's so all female. Yes, well. <laughs> okay, yes, <and> <laughs> we're looking yes and more like it. We're looking forward to it. how many songs do we have on it. My time is up. We'll have to go. But how many songs I, do we I have? have on it? We have about fourteen songs on the album, actually. Yes, oh, about good. 14. I'm looking at between ten to fourteen songs. I really want, don't want to throw everything on an album yeah. and it gets lost. So, and these are artists. female artists from across what the globe, the continent? Ac across the globe, yes, across the globe. You mm -hmm. know, and I might surprise a lot of people as well. So, things. give us one surprise before we go. I mean, I have my girl here. I mean, of course, Efia. You know, who's oh, my, great. you know, my. Yes, yeah, Sophia is definitely on that album. And that song is massive, you know, massive. I can't wait nice. for all of you to hear that song. It's a little overdue. Any, any you know, international? So Girl. Global icon, maybe. A Beyonce, fingers Rihanna. Crossed. Okay, well, we'll keep our fingers crossed. We're not keeping <laughs> okay, cool. No problem. But thank you so much. And Overcome is great. Uh, we hope that you're thank able to raise as much as possible uh, to also support with your the help, trust fund. With your help, I will, Bella. Thank definitely. you so much for having me. Thank you, too. And we'll be coming for that corner in your room. It's beautiful, by the way. And so that's <laughs> Becca. <laughs> and she has an, uh, well, a song celebrating frontline uh, workers all across the country and across the world as well. So we'll, we'll leave you with that. But before that, Anita also has some messages for you. Thank okay. you, Becca. This one says, good morning, ladies. Has, uh, is our health system not overwhelmed yet? Because at the beginning, we were hearing that if we exceed even 1,000 cases, it will be difficult for our system. If not, then at what point are we going to be overwhelmed? Okay, this one says, Bella and Akufu. Okay, I'm Anita. <laughs> good morning. So with all these facts before the president, he still wants the EC to compile a new register. Please kindly tell the president. We are watching. Okay, good morning. Please, Obuasi must be locked down now. I can't afford to lose my family. Okay. Good morning, Bella. Coronavirus is really colonizing the world at large. God have mercy on us. Good morning, Bella and Anita. Looking at the new speed rate of the infection, are we still saying we are at the flat part of the curve? You mean uh, we haven't flattened the curve yet? Well, we haven't. But hopefully by uh, the end of the month, definitely things should get better. But my name is Anita Ikiyoko. For this has been COVID-19 360. Definitely. With... My name is Brella Mundi and we're leaving you with Beckers Overcome. Have a good day. Keep watching TV3.